Welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. We've got guest author Randy Hain. Two books. First, Special Children, Blessed Fathers, Encouragement for Fathers of Children with Special Needs. And also a second book, Joyful Witness, How to Be an Extraordinary Catholic. And uh, thank you, Randy, for being here at EWTN. And uh, I personally want to thank you because the book you did on Special Children, Blessed Fathers, you, you asked me to contribute mm -hmm. to, and I was happy to do it. And uh, you've got some other great contributors that people know from EWTN, Joe Pierce, Greg Willits, Kevin Lowry, and there's seven others people would remember mm -hmm. their name. You got a, a forward by the, the great Archbishop Charles Chaput mm -hmm. of, uh, of Philadelphia, so it's wonderful. But what you now you unfortunately, or fortunately, let's say this, but fortunately have a reason to write, care about a book like this as well. And it's not just because you feel uh, that you wanted to reach out to fathers like myself. It's because you're a father of a special needs child as well, right? I am. I am I'm blessed to have a son with high-functioning autism. His right. name is Alex. Right. And uh, he's the inspiration for so many good things in, uh, in my life. In fact, a uh, story for another time, but uh, my family's Catholic because of Alex and his, uh, how he changed my heart many years ago and that led me to uh, come into the church. That's interesting because I always could say, for the good or the bad of the people working here at EWTN, I wouldn't be at EWTN if it wasn't for my son Matthew, mm -hmm. who's a high functioning autistic as well. So mm -hmm. I understand what you mean. Now, the, right at the beginning here, Most Reverend Michael J. Sheridan says Randy Hain has drawn on the wisdom of fathers, including himself, of special needs children, as well as the wisdom of the saints to provide this very supportive and helpful book. Why do you think, you know, men? need this help? Because, you know, most people would say in general the main caretaker, and certainly in a situation with a special needs child, mm -hmm. is usually going to be the mom. Mm -hmm. She's going to be the one on the front line. and That certainly was the case in my life. So why aren't you writing a book supporting them? Why did you decide there was a book needed for men? You know, for the last couple of years I've been writing about uh, men-related issues. So I spent a lot of time talking to Catholic men. And as I encounter men who have children with special needs, you know, it became pretty apparent that the vast majority of them struggle to fully engage and help their spouses mm -hmm. in the raising of these children. They would uh, lose themselves in their careers. They would mm -hmm. focus on work, anything but dealing with the issue that they found to be difficult, maybe even painful. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, there was also a number of them who uh, let their marriages slip away from them because they were so focused on not dealing with the issue of having a child with special needs. And isn't there statistics that kind of show that when you have a special needs child, many times in the family, that there's a higher level of divorce? Is that in fact true? I think I remember hearing it's that. It's somewhat but, anecdotal, but uh, yeah. numbers will tell you that it's in the 60 to 70 percent range. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's a little bit anecdotal, not always proven statistically, but certainly there is a higher percentage. It's challenging. You and I mm -hmm. both know it takes both me and my wife right. some days to get a typical day and we love our son right. but it, it can be challenging and that's why the sacramental bond I think in marriage mm -hmm. and uh, is so important I know for us marriage encounter was a big thing mm -hmm. that helped us I think deal with and prepare to, to work together mm -hmm. as a couple uh, in in the marriage and in the family to, to support our son right Matt and being you know, he's a great guy so I mean I couldn't have asked for a better son you know in the beginning of the forward uh, Charles Chaput says he taught me how to choose love he's talking about his own father mm -hmm. fathers choose to love and choose to remain with their children in a way most mothers do not I thought this was really interesting because mother love is simply more intense more natural more organic Nothing in fatherhood is as automatic or as biologically directed as motherhood. Real father love is entirely a free will act of self-sacrifice. Lived well, it gives us a window into God's own fatherhood. And to some degree, he's right on the money. And it's mm -hmm. also an explanation of why we're having so many problems mm -hmm. with un, uh, children out of wedlock and things like that because fathers aren't connecting and they're not as connected to the child. Right, right. Well, you know, I look at, uh, I look at my son Alex and I have another son, Ryan, and the love that I feel for my children uh, transcends so many things. It's powerful. And I have a responsibility because, as you and I both know, our vocation is to help our families get to heaven and, and to really take care of our families. And I think that men need to reconnect to that and understand that, you know, this isn't just, you know, a piece of your life. Your life is to help your family get to heaven. So I think that uh, the book is really meant to inspire fathers to look at their families mm -hmm. differently and hopefully through the book and the examples of the great fathers like yourself in there, look at the examples they set and the tactics they used and the approaches and how they lived out their Catholic faith to connect to that so important vocation. Well, one of the things I think that, and, and that's why I sort of misspoke at the beginning because it's difficult, yes, but there's, there's incredible blessings that come mm -hmm. and, the, and the insights you get 
into what's important in life. I know that was for me, was the mm -hmm. fact of realizing, in many cases, a very simple faith, a simple way of looking mm -hmm. at life, a, a very childlike way of thinking about good and evil and, and, and positive things like that, being a sort of my conscience at time to mm -hmm. kind of remind me of what I should be doing right or mm -hmm. what's important. One time we, we went out to lunch and he came back and it was a few minutes before we get, we'll go back to work and he said, oh, let's go, Dad, let's go to the chapel for a few minutes and stuff like that, you know, and mm -hmm. those kind of things like that. So uh, you, you get so many blessings and I think, again, I think that's what St. John Paul II showed people you know, that in the suffering, there's great love, mm -hmm. and you learn the lessons from those kinds of things, and in mm -hmm. many cases, those are the things you see as well mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a special needs child. I agree, and I think also, men have a tendency to superimpose on their children what they want them to be. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they put their dreams on their children, and when little Billy's not the quarterback of the team, or the starting pitcher, or the, you know, the, the PhD in philosophy, uh, you know, whatever it is, you, 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 you feel a sense of disappointment, but what we have to do is learn to accept our children where they are. Right, that's a great point. You go through a whole litany right in the beginning, kind of of all the things mm -hmm. many feel angry and frustrated. They're in denial about the diagnosis. I mean, I when I first heard it, I'm like, so well, he's autistic, so what does that mean? What, do you, what medication do you give without understanding mm -hmm. the depth of it? Uh, also, a sense of guilt one can have, depending. Uh, they, this is what you were saying, they feel severely let down when they recognize that their dreams for their child may not be realized. I remember, you know, certainly with my son, mm -hmm. you know, I had the great privilege of, uh, for a while, working with the New York Yankees. I worked directly with Mickey Mantle, so I have an autographed book to my son from Mickey Mantle. Mm -hmm. uh, he could care less if it was Mickey Mantle. He'd probably be happier if it was Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. As he told me one day, I'm not much into sports, Dad. So, you know, it was kind of like, it was, it, that was a great lesson to, again, mm -hmm. realize these other things are so uh, transitory. Mm -hmm. uh, they're there, what, what do they really mean? Right, right. Yeah. absolutely. No, and Alex uh, has his own interest and uh, he's a, a fascinating, bright kid, but I've had to learn how to embrace him where he's at with, with the things he loves to do and to celebrate his successes, but they're different than, say, the, the typical child successes. Right, exactly. You know, my, my younger son's a lacrosse player. That's where we get our sports fun and glory right, there. Right, yeah. But Alex is different, but uh, it's a great kind of different. Right. Now you say, when in, right in the idea, in the fall of 2014, I just completed a manuscript for Joyful Witness, which we're going to mm -hmm. talk about in, in a minute. and. Uh, you say here that you were thinking about, I was exhausted in need of sabbatical from writing after releasing two books in one year, but God had other plans. I prayed in interest for weeks during Eucharistic adoration. What God wanted me to do next as I prayed, I could not get the idea for a book of encouragement for the fathers of children special needs out of my mind. If men are struggling, perhaps the Holy Spirit might work through a book like this to reach them. So that is the genesis, that's what drove you forward. Absolutely, I, I, I assure you, I went to the chapel not even remotely interested in writing another book. I was tired. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I think God finds us in our weakness sometimes and challenges us to trust in Him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became a, a trust exercise for me to say, you know what, Lord, I don't have the energy, the strength, but I trust that this will get done, and it mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you seem to yourself have, have turned to St. Joseph, mm -hmm. yes. okay, and you talk about powerful lessons from St. Joseph. The first one was obedient accepting of God's will, selfless sacrifices, led by example, showed great fortitude. St. Joseph was a leader. Are those the things that we as men in general should display? And certainly I think in a, a situation where you have a wife who then herself is struggling mm -hmm. with taking care of the special needs child, trying to make sure the other children in the mm -hmm. family are not feeling neglected mm -hmm or uh, not giving the proper attention to, also the stress that goes with that. And you know, you talk about the guilt that sometimes we mm -hmm. as men might feel. Mm -hmm. Well, for the wife or the mother, it can be even more dramatic because this child came from her. Mm -hmm. And so there can really be the idea of what's wrong with me. I don't know if you agree with this, but as I get older, I find uh, I'm, I'm drawn to simplicity. And instead of trying to overcomplicate what is pretty basic, I look for great simple examples. And St. Joseph provides really the greatest for fathers. The man who never spoke a, a word in the Bible through his actions, the, the, the things that I, you just read that I listed, mm -hmm. these are wonderful examples for men. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I find that I'm drawn to that simple model uh, more and more. I pray every day for his intercession mm -hmm. and I find in him how I want to live as a father. Have you found in, in, do, in, in, in talking to people who've read this book and maybe your own response from reading the various mm -hmm. stories by Joe Pearson, Kevin Lowry, and, uh, and yourself, obviously, mm -hmm. you know your story, and uh, mm -hmm. Greg Willits. Uh, 
we found a marriage encounter that we had three different teams who would present and it was really really important because everybody was different and they told different stories in different ways and they reached people in different places in their life mm -hmm. so in a sense the fact that you've got the multiplicity of stories rather than just you writing your own story mm -hmm. In many ways, allows you to touch more people in different ways. Have you found that? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And, and this has been mainly feedback from readers. You know, when I was praying about the book and, and, and really decided to launch the project, one of the first things I did is I, I started reaching out to the Catholic men who mm -hmm. I knew who had special needs children. And how ironic that so many of them are Catholic authors. Mm -hmm. And each one of them said immediately, I'm in, sign me up, I want to do that. But what happened was, and I couldn't have predicted this, is the, the eclectic stories that came together really touched mm -hmm. so many different aspects of what it means to be a father for special needs child. So the readers have told me, wow, it, you, you cover the whole gamut, but I want to tell you, I don't think I could have ever designed that on my own. It just right. came together that way. Right, and, and that's the way because, you know, obviously, like many things in life, there are all different uh, levels of disabilities mm -hmm. or special needs, you know, and how, you know, someone, child who's verbal or not verbal right. and, and, and all those things. You know, and near the back of the book, you say, Guide for Fathers of Children with Special Needs. Keep Christ at the center of our lives. This is number three. Stay devoted to our Catholic faith and pray throughout the day. We can't. We can't hope to make this journey without Christ at our side. I think that's so important. It's also interesting too, I would say, because sometimes you can wonder uh, which the effect is. In some ways, many times you see people who have turned and are hanging onto their faith because they have gone through things mm -hmm. that are like this, dealing with a special needs child where they realize, I'm not in charge. Right. I need to rely on, on God mm -hmm. in order to get through this. You see, it's interesting. Uh, there are probably two ways to look at this. In my own example, it was Alex and his diagnosis that ultimately was the catalyst that brought me to Christ and the church. Right. So I have a, uh, I have a, a, a viewpoint of this where I couldn't imagine life without Christ at mm -hmm. the center. So yes, my prayer life, how I try to live my life is very much informed by my faith, but Alex really was the catalyst to mm -hmm. start it all. But I meet other men who are missing something, they're struggling, they're trying to do it all on their own or they're in denial. Mm -hmm. And if they would just acknowledge right. Christ's place and the role the church plays in our lives, uh, it would change everything. It would make this journey easier. Accept your child and stop wishing for a better version of God's precious gift. You know, it's, it's so interesting in, in my own mind. I, I, I always come to the point of saying, I don't feel bad for my wife and I. We've been gifted with Matt. I mean, sometimes I feel bad for Matt mm -hmm. that there are things in life that he won't experience that we had the chance of experiencing. And so, you know, I can feel, I hope, mm -hmm. you know, I'll ask him once in a while, are you happy, are you okay? How are things going, you know, and things like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, he's got a different perspective anyway of what he believes is, mm -hmm. you know, fulfillment, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and things like that, so, and, uh, it's just interesting. You say, when in doubt, engage. Don't know what to do to help your child engage and figure it out. Not sure what your wife needs from you. Engage and talk about it until you learn. Men, we have to engage you. So that's, again, what a main mm -hmm. thing you said. That it's typical of men anyway to be mm -hmm. many times disengaged. Right. But certainly, like you said, when you've got a special needs child, you're not sure what to do. Obviously, you're in a situation where there's going to be more stress. That's going to mean that your relationship with your spouse may be a little more strained mm -hmm. because she spent the whole day you know, dealing with it or trying to figure out what doctor to go to mm -hmm. or this doctor or that, or is there another, uh, uh, you know, therapy that we should be using or not using? Mm -hmm. Am I letting my child down? You know, all those things come into the mix. There's a myth out there that uh, men often will spout to me that, you know, we need to meet our wives halfway. No, that's wrong. Right. You need to go all the way every right. day and don't worry about, you know, keeping score. Mm -hmm. So when I come home, and may, I may have had a very stressful day with clients and my business, but no matter what, if my wife needs me to jump in, Mm -hmm. I need to go right in as tired as I may be because right. you know she is my partner she's my wife and I love her and I want to make sure that I give her what she needs right. so I need to jump in and give her a break and it doesn't matter what I've been through and I have to expect that when I'm at my low point she's going to jump in and do right, that for exactly. me as well yes yeah, that hundred percent hundred percent really which That's is what a sacramental relationship and a marriage mm -hmm. is really supposed to be all about what story uh, besides your own mm -hmm. uh, Tut, and, and don't mention mine, I, I mean, that's not the <laughs> okay. case. But one other story in the book that you think either touched you the most when you first read it. J.D. Flynn's story okay. touched me the most. Um, he and his wife at a relatively young age adopted two babies with Down syndrome. Wow, it was okay. such a selfless act of love. 
And they did it because not only are they uh, ardent pro-lifers, but they wanted to make sure that they were taking, you know, two children that would just not have had any chance right. into their home and show them, you know, love. And they did, and these children are now, I think, 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. They've had a, a plethora of health issues, yeah. but they could not be a happier, more fulfilled family. But JD's story about the pain, the struggle, mm -hmm. but ultimately the triumph of that adoption process and what they've been mm -hmm. through, is it's heartwarming, it right. really is. Right, so the book is Special Children, Blessed Fathers, Encouragement for Fathers of Children with Special Needs. Let's move on to the book that you had just finished putting to bed mm -hmm. when this idea came to you during Eucharistic Adoration. Uh, Joyful Witness, How to Be an Extraordinary Catholic. And uh, now Teresa Tamio, our good friend, wrote the, uh, the forward to this. Now she's very joyful. She's always uh, uh, excited about the faith. Uh, you say, through my work as a senior editor of Integrated Catholic Life, parish ministry, my travels around the country to speak and promote my books, that you came up with the idea of doing this book. Uh, it's kind of interesting here you're going from special needs people later on here you're talking about a joyful witness uh, What do you mean when you say someone's a joyful witness? You know, I uh, I'm an interviewer by nature I like to talk to people and get their stories and um, I've always been drawn to those people who through um, actually uh, very little conversation but more through observing them kind of in action that they really live out uh, our faith beautifully. You know, clearly Pope Francis is the best joyful witness we can all imagine. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really love, I'm drawn to people who are just kind of the ordinary folk doing great things for Christ in the church. So when I think about joyful witness, I see them and they've got something special and I want that in my life. And I wanted to go out and interview and find those, those people. So the book is a collection mm -hmm. of stories of ordinary Catholic heroes doing amazing things for Christ in the church. Right, and, and it's kind of like Mother Teresa said, you know, the idea. Mm -hmm taking the ordinary and doing the extraordinary. Yes. Right, exactly. So that, so Jeannie, Jeannie Lyons would have been one of those people, right? Absolutely. Jean Lyons uh, is the special needs coordinator at St. Peter Schnell Parish, our home parish. And um, the way that she interacted with my son Alex and, and, a, and a plethora of other families with special needs children and loved them, Alex today um, races to any activity at the parish. Alex is a lector at our parish. Alex has done so many things because of Jean's just unqualified love and acceptance mm -hmm. of him. And the way that she does that for so many families, and she doesn't take the credit, she just wants to do it behind right. the scenes. She's a great example of a regular Catholic. And, and that's the kind of thing when I, I don't, you know, I've, we, have, we had someone at uh, our, our parish, you know, it was a Down syndrome young man. He mm -hmm. sang with the choir and he was, and you know, it was, uh, it was just inspirational, mm -hmm. you know, cause, because as you know, what you see is the incredible love that they have for their faith mm -hmm. and how much they, t how important they view this and, and you know, and seriousness they take it. Uh, you know, it's maybe more serious than some of us regular Catholics mm -hmm. who show up there, you know, as far as the importance of it. And, and it just really touches people. And, and that's what we, we need to be open and people need to see that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the things that used to happen before people got locked away, they got put away, nobody really could see them. But I think now in everyday life, when you meet and these people, you get a better understanding of, of how much they have to offer. Mm -hmm. Now, in, you talk about at the end of the, this particular chapter, you have questions for reflections, but you also have some points, four ways to show more compassion and love, and you're talking about her, embrace others, love all of God's creation, see Christ in everyone, turn adversity into ministry. Mm -hmm. And then uh, questions for reflection. Why did you decide to put re reflection questions? I mean, is this something you're thinking people would use at a parish or is it just a personal kind of a thing? You know, it's a, I, I like to challenge people to think about what they've read, but I, I really envision this in small faith groups, uh, you know, books, book groups, whatever. whatever. I, I think it's, it's good for people mm -hmm. to read what they've, they've just experienced and kind of force them to address maybe the reality, harsh or unharsh but I wanted them to, to really be challenged by it. But one of the things about the, the, the book and the stories mm -hmm. is the people, all of the folks that I had a chance to, to talk to, they all have these, these very interesting, again, quiet ways of living out their faith. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to be lost. So at the end of every chapter, I'm kind of forcing the reader right. to review that, reflect on it, and see how you do it in your own life. Right, and these are the kinds of people who are not running around saying, put me in your book. 
In fact, every single person, Doug, every single person who I contacted about the book, their first reaction was, I'm not worthy to be in your book. Right, and I said, right. well, the humility is wonderful, and that's exactly why I want you right. in the book. Well, Katie Peterson Warner, uh, uh, people would know, uh, she talks about her mom here being a true hero. I have never mm -hmm. met anyone more prayerful, more trusting, more more deeply in love with Jesus Christ, the most humble and profound way. And of course, she's actually the the daughter of uh, Tom Peterson yes. from Catholics Come Home. She actually has a book out, mm -hmm. uh, and we had a chance to talk to her. She's a. I told Tom, he's he, you've done good. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things at the end she talks about is being a Catholic multitasker. Now we always hear these days, you're not really supposed to be doing that anymore. That's not good for you. You know, it's you're distractive. But she says we're not meant to use our jobs and busy family lives excuses for not going deeper in our faith. Mm -hmm. So I guess in that way she's saying, don't get caught up in just doing everything that you got to do every day, mm -hmm. and use that as an excuse why you can't pray mm -hmm. or you can't go to mass. I guess the other thing is that comes with that is reprioritization, right? And right. saying you only have a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. It's a question of how you spend your time really determines. Mm -hmm. Uh, the trajectory of your life, right? I think Katie's talking about sanctifying everything mm -hmm. you do. If it's, you know, if it's giving your baby a bottle, if it's cleaning your house, if it's going and running a, a billion dollar company, whatever mm -hmm. it is, sanctify everything and offer it up to God. Mm -hmm. And I think she lives a great example of that. Now you've got in here Father uh, Roger Landry, yes. who's been on EWTN before. Mm -hmm. He was uh, during our interregnum coverage, we have him. He's, mm -hmm. uh, I think he's got a photographic memory or something pretty close to that. Yes. Uh, why did you Why did you decide to pick him? He's a priest, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, so well, of course, priests are holy. Uh, mm -hmm. they, well, how come this isn't just all lay people? I was drawn to his writings um, when we first launched Integrated Catholic Life about five years ago. And I, I love the clarity of his writing, mm -hmm. and I was really drawn to that. So I followed him over the years. Uh, I've never actually met Father Landry. We've spoken on the phone. Oh, really? You haven't? Oh, no. he's a very nice guy. But, he has uh, a twin. He's a twin, actually. Yeah, and it's funny. Yeah, I've, yeah, uh, yeah. I've actually interacted with him more than his brother. Okay. But uh, I reached out to him for this book because of all the priests I know, and not to diminish the wonderful priests in our lives, but he is the clearest thinking, and just he, he shares from the heart uh, what a great message he has. And I wanted to capture that story for the book, and he what he gave us was a wonderful mm -hmm. gift. Yeah, at the end it talks about he preaches the gospel as good news rather than bad news, which is certainly I think what our present Holy Father is saying. He's not saying, you know, uh, don't tell the truth, but make sure people understand that mm -hmm. the, the proclamation is good. Because he follows it up with, he, rep he presents the real Jesus. Rather than present a domesticated version of Jesus that is lifeless, boring, and unchallenging, Father Landry invites people to know the real Jesus mm -hmm. and not the kind of, uh, I think we're living in the kind of the post hippie kind mm -hmm. of uh, Alan Alda kind of Jesus that's mm -hmm. kind of out there mm -hmm. right now. He delivers the truth in love and there's no watered down Christianity, no watered down church with Father Landry. It's the truth, but it's so compelling that you're drawn to it. And, and he talks about the lore of lukewarmness, not being exposed to people on fire for the faith. Many Catholics just go through the motions because they haven't been exposed to Catholics who are giving their all. The cure for this kind of lukewarmness is falling in love with Jesus and it often happens by close session of somebody already very much with him. I think that's one of the things, obviously reading a good Catholic book, but certainly watching EWTN, I think, mm -hmm. uh, with the World Meeting of Families that we had back in September, of course, you know, people can see there's people around the world mm -hmm. who are not only in love with Jesus, but in love with their church. Mm -hmm. uh, and for people to realize you're not alone, mm -hmm. that there's other people who really believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think a lot of us in our everyday life, we don't want confrontation, we don't want anybody to get mad at us, you know, we're trying to go mm -hmm. through our life. Nobody seems to be able to believe what I really believe mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And even if I go to church, you know, Catholics tend to be, to some degree, isolationists in many mm. parishes where they kind of go. And I think that's good. People should be able to take their faith where they, where, however they like to do it. That's why there's all these religious orders in different styles. But I think it's important, like he's saying in here, for people to realize there are plenty of people on fire for the faith. And if you are, you should step out. I'll make a point in the book of talking about how you should at some point in Mass, look around you and know that you're probably surrounded by everyday regular Catholic heroes. Take the time to really get to know the people in your parish because there are folks there doing some incredible things. You know the old 80-20 rule, right? Right. Well, th these folks are out there doing amazing things and you could probably learn from their joyful example. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, if you want to look at the opposite of lukewarmness, you want to look at someone right. who's really being a joyful witness. I also think sometimes some of us uh, you know, we'll get annoyed at the uh, the 20% who are doing 80% of everything kind of a thing. But at the same time, it's like, is that just an easy excuse? Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. to say, uh, well, uh, I'm, well, I'm not going to do that because uh, so-and-so does that all mm -hmm. the time, and so they won't want me doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and we can run into that sometimes sure. in parishes. We have to be open and, and realize that there's other people there who have talents and they need to be brought into the mix as well because at the end of the day, it makes the parish better. Right. But, but sometimes we'll do that. You also have a person in here, uh, you know, Catherine Lopez, who a lot of people mm -hmm. know through the media, uh, being the editor-at-large at National Review Online. Why did, why did you include her? She's one of the most authentic people I've ever met in my life. She's mm -hmm. an incredibly uh, truthful Catholic, uh, honest person about everything, but she's just real. Mm -hmm. And uh, I followed her for years. She's interviewed me a couple of times, and I just really appreciate mm -hmm. uh, what Catherine brings to the table, which okay. is pure authenticity. Just before we go, uh, you probably have three books in the works. <laughs> Anyone you'd like to tell us about? Now, I'm working on one right now uh, titled Too Busy for God? Mm -hmm. mark. And it's a, a roadmap for busy Catholics who are looking to lead a more integrated Catholic life. And mm -hmm. I want to give them a, a way to connect with their faith during the day. Okay, very good. Well, as always, a pleasure to talk to Thanks, you, Randy, Jeff. about two of his works. First, Special Children, Blessed Fathers, Encouragement for Fathers of Children with Special Needs, a book that means a lot to me, uh, available through our EW10 Religious Catalog, and also Joyful Witness, How to Be an Extraordinary Catholic. We're all working on those as well. It's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog as well. Thank you so much for joining us here on EWTN's Bookmark.